I need to say something. This is a very complicated game and a uh, very interesting, very entertaining game. And while we cannot hope to uh, replicate the quality of play of the great Bobby Fischer, there comes a moment of incredible uh, profundity in this game, just absolute clarity of understanding that if we actually go through this, we can learn this idea and implement it into our own games. I encourage you to do that. Now, you could skip ahead to this perfect move, this perfect idea of Fisher if you want, but I would encourage you to watch all the way through so that when it arrives, you really feel the impact of its brilliance, and then you can implement ideas like this into your own play. The game was uh, played in a match between Berlin and the United States. Uh, Bobby Fischer had white. His opponent was Klaus Darga, who by my research is actually still alive and turns 90 next month, so happy birthday to Grandmaster Darga. Uh, let us begin. Fischer, again, had white. He played e4. And uh, Grandmaster Darga, he played e6. The French defense, d4, d5, knight, c3, and bishop to b4. Again, we get a winner uh, French, which is a rule-breaking opening in many ways. Uh, Black will often exchange off what really seems to be his best minor piece, his dark-squared bishop, in an attempt to give some pawn structure damage to white. But there's also quite a bit uh, more going on uh, and a lot of unclear themes. Fisher had trouble with this line. Uh, e5, gaining space. C5, black attacks the base of white's pawn chain. And a3. In a game against Tall that we also covered, Tall actually played bishop to a5 here. The Grandmaster Darga plays the more standard bishop takes knight check. And after pawn takes, you can see the, uh, the pawn structure damage uh, done to white's position. Uh, but again, black is missing that very nice dark squared bishop. But black has a sneakier plan here, which we will see as the, the game unfolds. Knight to e7, and the main move for white usually is queen to g4, immediately attacking the g7 pawn. After queen to c7, we get what is known as the winner were poison pawn system, where basically black goes after white's king, which has a hard time to find safety, but white in return has two bishops and an h-pawn, and uh, that's usually the dynamics at play there. But Fisher plays a4, which is a more positional approach. Basically, he's making room for this bishop at c1 to go to a3 and place itself on this very nice a3 f8 diagonal, control those dark squares, which have now been forfeited by black because he gave up his dark square bishop. That's the idea. Queen to c7, putting pressure down the c-file, knight f3, and b6. We know in the French defense, black's uh, light-squared bishop is often a problem piece, so he wants to play bishop to a6 to trade it off for white's nice light-squared bishop. White doesn't want to do that, so uh, Fisher plays bishop to b5 check first. If Darga defends with the knight, then he would no longer be able to support a bishop on a6, so he goes ahead and plays bishop to d7, and now the bishop retreats to d3, and of course, black can no longer exchange off that light-squared bishop. Knight b to c6, put some pressure on d4, castling, and, and here black makes a, a very big decision. Castling is a little dangerous here. This Greek gift sacrifice is a very risky for black. After a few moves, you can see uh, computers just think white is crushing here, and no doubt he is, uh, but it would take forever to analyze it all, but it's too risky. So Darga plays the, this move c4, kicking the bishop back to e2, and he completely locks up the center. Now, sometimes when we see a locked center, we think, oh, that's going to be a slow maneuvering game. But actually, what Black has in mind in the winnower is an attacking concept. He wants to take his king and maybe bring it to safety on the queen side, and then just attack with these king side pawns, uh, white's king. So this is, even though it looks like a maneuvering position, it's actually an attacking concept from Black. So uh, a long castling would actually have been a perfectly good move here. He could have played king to b7, but instead he plays f6, immediately going after this pawn structure, now attacking the front of the pawn chain. Bishop to a3, Fisher finally does place that bishop on that very nice diagonal. And of course, the d6 square is very sensitive. Uh, a beautiful bishop on a3. Uh, black takes on e5, pawn takes e on e5. Um, it would 
After castling the knight to d4 and the potential of playing the pawn to f4, and white would get a nice bind on the king's side. So instead, black goes ahead and takes that pawn at e5. Uh, if bishop takes e7, yes, it would take away black's castling privileges. The problem is, uh, after rook to e1, let's say knight c6, black would just play the rook at a8 to f8, and the king would still be able to tuck back and be, uh, and be safe. So instead, Fisher plays rook to e1, putting that rook on that e-file opposite the king and also this vulnerable e6 pawn. Uh, knight 7 to c6 was played. Now, this is one of those positions where modern computers see stuff that humans almost impossible for them to see. Uh, here, knight 5 to c6 was actually the right move. Uh, and the reason is it, it keeps this knight on f3 and the bishop can't deliver a check on h5. That actually causes some trouble for black as we'll see here uh, in a minute. After knight g5 castle, bishop g4, again trying to attack e6 with everything. Uh, after rook to f6, white is a little bit better, but uh, after exchanges, black is almost equal. Uh, but knight 7 to c6 was played. Knight takes e5, knight takes e5. And here, Fisher could have played this move, bishop to h5, check. And it's strong for this reason. After g6, blocking the check and attacking the bishop, queen to d4 is very strong because it pins the knight to this rook at h8. And uh, after pawn takes bishop, rook takes, black has a complete bind on the dark squares. I mean, just look at this. This is crazy. And even ideas of queen to h4, queen to threatening mate on e7, the rook at a1 comes to e1, and uh, white is really dominating in this position. But what Fisher played does make a lot of sense. He plays f4. The idea is, again, to maybe play f5 and open up the e-line, aiming directly at the king. The knight goes to c6. And now bishop to g4, attacking e6. Fisher thought bishop h5 was actually uh, maybe a better option here than the movie played in the game. But uh, as it turns out, again, computer analysis shows that uh, this really isn't any better because of rook to h to e8. Uh, and here, in a complex position, it's fairly equal. So Fisher's instincts served him well in the game. Bishop to g4, directly attacking the, uh, the e6 pawn. Long castling, picking on e6. And here, again, black should play rook h to e8 uh, to keep you know, to get, get that last piece involved in the game. Um, it, after bishop takes d5, queen f4, uh, computers say this messy position is still, uh, still equal. Uh, but Klaus Darga plays the move bishop takes e6. Uh, natural enough, but after rook e6, Fisher actually has a very powerful position. The idea of the queen can go to f3, the pawn to f5, the rook can shift over and double on the e-file. Rook to d7 was played by black and now f5, and knight to d8 was played by Darga. Now, and this is an idea that Fisher did miss in my 60 memorable games. Um, he can actually leave the rook there if he wants. Uh, the move queen to f3 turns out to be quite strong. And if knight takes rook, pawn takes knight, you see this bishop on a3 combined with this pawn at e6 is very dangerous for black. Uh, there's really nothing. I mean, if he goes to e7, obviously the, the bishop can take the rook and the pawn at d5 is hanging. If he just moves the rook back, then e7. And uh, the combination of this bishop and this pawn are really hard to deal with. Rook to e8. Queen takes d5, and white is doing very, very well. Uh, but Fisher instead retreats the rook. Queen to f4 hits the rook and the pawn at f5, so rook f3 covers the rook as well as the pawn. Queen to e4. And now Fisher begins to eye black's king on c8. How is he going to get at that king? Uh, he plays a5, attempting to open lines. And this is a critical moment for black. He should have played b5, trying to keep these... A and B files as closed as he possibly can. Uh, but instead he plays knight to C6, Fisher takes on B6, and even still here, even at the cost of a pawn, the move, uh, excuse me, A5, continuing to keep these files blocked is probably the best choice available to him. But instead he plays A, B6, and now this open A file for the rook is quite strong. Fisher plays queen to b1, a very powerful move. You know, he only has these two files to deal with. It's a very narrow area of attack, 
but it's still a very dangerous attack, even with just those two files to work with. And uh, here, if king to b7, bishop to c5, taking advantage of the pin down the b file. If uh, rook to b7, then bishop d6, rook d8, bishop to g3, and we see a very strong position, this bishop controlling key squares, white is winning there. So instead, Klaus Darga plays king to c7. It doesn't allow the pin on the b uh, pawn, and also the bishop doesn't have access to d6. So this is a very important point in the game. This is the point where Fisher makes what I would call really a perfect rule, a perfect move. And he follows a rule that has, it's, it's named after an a Azerbaijan chess player named Makaganov. And it's called Makaganov's rule. And the rule is this, that if you can't find a plan, or even if you, you can, you should always consider improving the position of your worst placed piece. Now, it's somewhat ironic that this bishop on a3, which was the best placed piece during most of the game, really, uh, is now white's worst placed piece because there are no targets anymore on this diagonal. We'll definitely don't want to do that. Uh, there are no targets anymore on that diagonal. So if you were to just pick up that piece and place it anywhere on the board, not, not worried about the rules of, of piece movement, you just pick it up and put it anywhere, where would you put it? And if you answer that question, you can see exactly how to improve the worst placed piece. And this is something you can always implement in your games. You know, just take your worst placed piece. Where does this piece belong? And then whatever it takes to get it there, you do so. In this case, it involves a very interesting idea. Now, I'm going to reveal the move now. Uh, it involves an, a retreating move, bishop to c1. A very powerful idea. The bishop aims at f4, and that's it. That one retreating move, the game is over. Black is done. That bishop coming to f4 is already completely decisive. Queen to e1 check was played by Darga. Rook to f1, of course, blocks that. He takes the pawn at c3, but now bishop to f4 check. King to b7. And queen to b5. The threat is queen to a6 checkmate, because the bishop and the queen would crisscross and create a perfect mating pattern after queen to a6 it would be checkmate. Uh, we can look at some defensive possibilities. If rook to a8, you just exchange those, then queen to a6 check. Uh, if he blocks with the knight, you just take threatening mate, then you just check. And this, this leads to an eventual mate, but white's already up uh, a piece. If he blocks with the rook instead, just queen to c8, knight takes its mate in that way. Um, if knight to b8 to keep the queen out of a6, then you just take the knight. Uh, leaves the rook hanging. And of course, if black were to retake with the other rook, it would actually be, be a mate in that case. And the only other thing black can even do is queen to d4 check. And after king to h1, the only way to stop anything is actually just give up his queen with queen to f4. So because of that, after queen to b5, Klaus Darga resigns. So the real lesson from this game for me is Makaganov's rule, which is Always improve the position of your worst placed piece. And that can help any of us, even us lesser chess players, become stronger. I hope you enjoyed the game. See you again soon at Chess Talk. Goodbye.